From the University of Arizona Distance Learning Program, this is Optical Sciences 505, Diffraction and Interferometry, with Dr. James Wyant. This broadcast is authorized by the Arizona Board of Regents on behalf of the University of Arizona. Any reproduction or retransmission of this course or use of same for granting of credit without the express written consent of the University of Arizona is strictly prohibited. Well, say hello to you again. Let's see, when we finished last class, we were looking at the Fresnel diffraction of a rectangular aperture. So let's go back to the, the drawing here. And remember that to simplify the equations, we had said we'll locate the source on axis here. We'll look at a point in the diffraction pattern here on axis. And instead of looking around this plane, looking at the radiance at different points, <clears throat> what we will do is keep this point fixed and take our aperture, which was a slit of width A and height B. We'll take this aperture and we will move this aperture around, causing the irradiance to sweep past this point right here. So we can put in then the x prime is equal to y prime is equal to x equal y equal zero. And right at the end of the last class, we had done that and found out that the equation for the diffraction pattern here <coughs> is given by uh, point P goes as A, amplitude of what we're illuminating the aperture with, um, divided by I, lambda, Z1, Z2, E to the IK, Z1 plus Z2. And uh, then we have this integral here e to the i pi over lambda times uh, squiggle squared plus eta squared times 1 over z1 plus 1 over z2 d uh, squiggle d eta. The limits here are a little more complicated when, because the limits will change as we move this aperture around. And so for right now, we're just saying the limits go from eta 1 to eta 2 and squiggle 1 to squiggle 2. And I guess the last thing we did was we this mess out in front. We just cleaned that C prime. Okay, now let's see what we can what we can do with this equation. Now, <clears throat> the first thing we do is that we normally rewrite this up here. And what we'll do is we'll say that one over lambda times squiggle squared plus eta squared. Uh, times 1 over z1 plus 1 over z2. We'll rewrite that. Uh, we'll get common denominator here of lambda z1 z2. Lambda z1 z2. And then upstairs here, we'll get a squiggle squared times a z1 plus a z2, and here we'll get the eta squared times z1 plus z2. Okay. So now we're going to rewrite this equation, and this is, as I said earlier, is in many books in optics, uh, essentially all of them uh, covering um, uh, Fresnel diffraction. Uh, we'll go through a very similar derivation here. And so the next thing we're going to do is, let's say, let u equal eta times the square root of, we're going to put a 2 in here. It may seem a little strange, but we'll put a 2 in there times z1 plus z2 divided by lambda z1 z2. And then we'll take another variable, say v, and that's going to be a similar expression, but squiggle in front. And then this is again 2 times z1 plus z2 over lambda z1 z2. Okay, so this change of variables here. And when we plug this in to this expression here, play with it 
for just a little bit. What we will get is that u at point P is something, I'm just going to call it C in a minute, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, figure out what C is equal to. And um, now <coughs> we can separate this into two integrals. First one being e to the i pi u squared over 2 du. And I don't know what the limits are, so I just call it u1 to u2. Later we'll see what the limits are. And then we're left with this next integral, which is e to the i pi v squared over 2 dv. And again, I don't know what the limits are, so I'll just say v1 to v2. OK, so it's fairly, um, I guess, fairly straightforward to get to that, but uh, uh, maybe not obvious why we wanted to do it, but it's fairly straightforward to get to it in any case. OK, so we have this result. Before we, we look at these integrals here, um, I'm kind of worried about c. What is C? So let's see if we can answer that. What is C? I guess you hope it's not the grade you get in this course. But other than that, we'll see what it is here. So um, what we'll do here, we'll go back and I'm going to calculate what C prime times d squiggle d eta is. That will then tell me what C is. So C prime, D squiggle, D eta. Um, well, from C prime, we got an A over I lambda Z1, Z2. And we have an E to the I, K, Z1 plus Z2. So that's just the C prime. And now when we do the d squiggle uh, d eta, we're going to get, well, from our definitions here, we're going to get a square root of lambda z1 z2 over 2 uh, z1 plus z2. We're going to get that twice, so we're going to get that squared, du, dv. OK. And multiplying that out, we're going to get a nice result, it turns out here. We're going to get an a, e to the i, k, z1 plus z2. So that didn't change any. Going to get a 2 here. We had an i there. Lambdas will cancel. z1 times z2 will cancel. And we get a z1 plus z2 here. Okay. Oh, and I guess I have a du dv. And so the result then, kind of nice. What is c? Well. C then, well, C is going to be this right here. But what is that? Therefore, C is equal to, well, we have this 2i here, which I just put in there. And this is just the amplitude of the wavefront at this point if we have a completely clear aperture. So the, the source is a distance C1 plus C2 away. And so that would be U double zero of P, where U double zero of P is the unobstructed amplitude at P. It's kind of interesting. Works out that way. OK, so 
we end up with this mess here multiplied by u double zero p over 2i. Well, these integrals are not simple integrals, but they're integrals that are certainly well known. And we write them here that say c of u. Yeah, but it's integral from u um, 0 to u of cosine pi t squared over 2 dt. And what we'll call s of u is the integral from 0 to, to um, u of sine pi t squared over 2 dt. And these are called the Fresnel integrals. And uh, so what we can do if we call these uh, the cosine and the sine Fresnel integrals, we can go back and we can rewrite this expression right here simply as, take a clean sheet of paper, Okay, so we're saying, I'll just repeat this since you need a little more time to write it. We're saying that these are the Fresnel integrals. C of u is the integral from 0 to u of cosine pi t squared over 2 dt. And S of u is the integral from 0 to u of sine pi t squared over 2 dt. And so now we'll go back to the expression we had here or u of p, and write it in terms of these Fresnel integrals. So let's do that. Ready to go on? And so we can say here that <coughs> u of p is u double zero of p over 2i times cosine Fresnel integral c, limit u2. We still don't know what the limits are, but we'll figure that out later. Minus the limit at the lower integral, the lower limit of the integral, plus i sine uh, or s of u2 minus s of u1. So that takes care of one direction, and then we need to do the other direction. And so that will be c of v2 minus c of v1. That's not an i, that should be a 1 there. Um, plus i s of v2 minus s of v1. So the result in here is just calculated from these Fresnel integrals, the cosine Fresnel integral and the sine Fresnel integrals, where we're going to have to, at some point, we're going to shortly, we have to find what these limits are here and plug that in. And so this is simply equal to u does double zero p. So what we would have with a clear aperture, divided by 2i times some complex number, I don't know what it is, but a e to the i psi, um, b e to the i chi, say. So this is just some complex number, and this is another complex number that we calculate from the Fresnel integrals. And... Um, then if we want, we could say that i of p is 1 quarter i double zero of p a squared b squared. So just squaring this, we'll get the 1 quarter factor out in front, whatever we'd have for a clear aperture times whatever the magnitude of this one is squared times magnitude of that one squared. So now what this reduces to is that we have to know the Fresnel integrals. 
and um, there are a few ways of finding out the Fresnel integrals. And uh, in previous years, what I've what I've covered at this point in the course was a thing called the Cornu spiral. How many of you have seen the Cornu spiral? Most of you. How many of you love the Cornu spiral? Eh, I don't know. I've I've yet to meet the first person other than maybe Cornu, who I didn't actually meet uh, by a long time, who loved the Cornu spiral. And I'm following Goodman's lead where he says that's now to date. We're not even going to talk about it. Okay. So if any of you want to look at this geometrical way of solving these integrals, um, and it's in lots of books. I think it's in Hex book. It's in tons of books out there. But I don't plan to talk about the Cornu spiral. I think you know the better way of solving this, you know, if you don't have a computer, I hope there's no one here who doesn't have a computer, but if you don't have a computer, you can look these up in, in tables. And... Um, if you have a computer, you may still want to look them up in tables. I don't know, but there are a lot of programs out there that will calculate these Fresnel integrals. And so I think rather than uh, spending our time talking about the Cornu spiral and how to use that, I'm mm. going to assume that either you have, you have tables you can look these up in or you, you have it on your computer and that you can calculate these Fresnel integrals. And once we know that, I mean, we still don't know the limits yet. We have to worry about that. We'll figure out the limits uh, shortly here. But uh, once we find out the limits, it'll be fairly easy then to just look up what the answers are here. Before we go on to look at the limits, um, I guess, you know, looking here, we said this, each one of these would be a complex number. We have an A e to the i phase and a B e to the i phase. And normally, we're just interested in the irradiance, and so we don't care much about the phase. But there are cases where you do want the phase, and one case would be, say, if you're using Babinet's principle. And right at the end of this section, we'll say just a little bit about using Babinet's principle. But if you're using Babinet's principle, um, then you will need to know what the phase factor is here. Otherwise, you probably don't. Okay, well... We still haven't quite solved the equation for the disturbance here because I don't know what the limits are yet. So let's think about how we're going to calculate the limits. And so remembering here that what we're doing is that we have these two points fixed and we have this aperture here that has some width and height associated with it, but it's moving around as we're sweeping out the diffraction pattern ac across over this plane here. And so we have to look at the limits as we move this around. And to do that, what we're going to, we're going to introduce the new parameters, and from these new parameters, we'll find the limits. So I guess I will say, I don't give this a number or anything, but I'll call this the effect of translating the aperture sideways. The effect of translating aperture. And I won't say sideways because we may, we're going to translate it up and down also. But for right now, let's just worry about translating it in one direction here. We're going to introduce a new parameter. And we have these U's Let's introduce a delta u. And delta u, now well, we're trying to find these limits here. Delta u um, is u2 minus u1. And if we go back and look at how we got the u's, back a couple of three pages here. Um, remember u was eta times the square root of 2 z1 plus z2 divided by lambda z1 z2. And um, so I'm going to make a delta u, which goes, would be the u for one side of the aperture minus u at the other side of the aperture. Okay. And so that's b, 2 z1 plus z2 over lambda z1, z2, 
and then the square root of this mess. Okay, so it's just u at one side of the aperture minus u at the other side of the aperture, and um, um, in this direction here, um, the ap aperture width is b. So this becomes a b out in front here. And then I've got to define something else here, u naught. That will be the average of the two u's, u1 plus u2. And so that's going to be the u corresponding to wherever the center of this aperture is as I move it around, wherever the center is. And in the eta direction, that's eta naught. Um, and so this is 2 z1 plus z2 over lambda z1 z2 square root. So b was the aperture width. And eta naught was the coordinate of the center of the aperture. And so now, this integral will have the limits. Lost the integral here, but find it. So the limits here on this integral, or these um, Fresnel integrals, will be the following. One will be u naught minus delta u over two. And the other one, as you can guess, will be u naught plus delta u over two. Okay, so that will be the upper and the lower and the upper limit for u and for v you you can find a very similar expression. Okay. So now we know you know, we can calculate these, we can plug that in, and we can look up our Fresnel integrals and calculate the diffraction pattern. Now, maybe the only tricky thing right now is that we're, we are dealing with things in this plane here. As we move this around, we're finding, you know, the center of that aperture. That was our eta naught. And... Uh, the width is is the b, and I probably you know I'm probably interest so I'm finding things in terms of coordinates here. But you probably want to know things the amplitude and coordinates here, so we have to have a little um, transformation from these coordinates to these coordinates, and it's a, just a similar triangles we'll look at, and so it's going to be on the observation plane. You're going to have it y naught. Um, I guess I don't. Yeah, y naught is equal to eta naught z1 plus z2 over z1. Okay. So just going from I have a source here, z1 away, and similar triangles from here to here to here. And so motions here then are amplified over here by this factor z1 plus z2 over z1. Okay, so that's about it. And in a couple, a few minutes, we'll, a couple minutes, we'll look at some examples. But uh, any questions at this point? So the whole problem then really boils down to plugging in your numbers to calculate these limits here, and then plugging that into the Fresnel integrals, which you can look up or calculate on the computer, however you wish, and calculate the amplitude, square that and get the intensity.
Okay. Well, before we look at some examples, I want to, um, you know, some way get a little feel, I guess, for delta u. I mean, this is kind of a kind of a strange little thing here. I guess it has no no units because it's. Uh, um, we have what uh, same units above and below here, the same dimensions here. So units cancel out. So what, what you know, kind of what does this delta u really mean here? And so let's calculate something that it's kind of interesting. Called uh, we're going to calculate a Fresnel number. Now, we calculated Fresnel zones and having to do with circular apertures. And here we're going to calculate something similar, but having to do uh, at least some Fresnel number associated with a rectangular aperture. So let's go back to remember what we have here. We had some aperture of width b. Okay. We had a source over here, a distance z1 away. And we're looking over here at some point p, a distance z2 away. So we could have, if we go right to the edge of the aperture, we have this path length and that path length. And um, Think here for a second. That um, this path length plus that path length would be um, uh, well. The radius here is b over two, so it would the OPD would be b over two squared times one over two z one plus one over two. Z2. Okay, so again, the same approximation we've been making all along for this length and that length. And I can say that that's equal to some number, n sub f, half waves. And the, the first distance here, if we call that R1, that would be, we could write that as, um, uh, you know, the, the sag here from a spherical wave. I've, I've subtracted out the straight through distance here. But the uh, sag here is just a radius squared, b over 2 squared, divided by twice the distance, the y squared over 2r term that we keep talking about. So I subtracted out, you know, I'm finding this distance here and subtracting out this distance here. And it's just a y squared over 2r. So b over 2 squared over 2z1. And then the same thing for over here. So that's the difference in the path here and here relative to the path along here. And I'm just saying let some number of half waves. And we're going to call that Fresnel number. OK, everyone with me? And the whole goal here, you know, I have this crazy thing, delta u. I don't know what delta u, um, kind of weird thing. What, what does it really mean? So I'm trying to figure that out. So we have this expression. So I could solve for n sub f, Fresnel number. And um, that's going to be b squared over 8. Um, times z1 plus z2 over z1, z2 um, divided by lambda over 2. And um, we'll rewrite that as 1, eight, eight, one over 8 b squared times um, 2 z1 plus z2 
over lambda z1, z2. Okay. And if I go back and look at this crazy parameter, delta u we had here, I see that this Fresnel number is delta u squared over 8. So that delta u thing is related to the Fresnel number, related to how many half waves we have going across the aperture. And the relationship turns out to be a, that the Fresnel number is delta u squared divided by 8. Now again, when Goodman goes through this, he likes to have um, z1 be infinity, so you can you can do that if you want. But I like to have it a little more general than that because often when we do Fresnel diffraction, we don't illuminate the aperture with a plane wave. Now it turns out if you go through all these Fresnel calculations, you'll find out that for delta u greater than about 10, some number like that, we're going to get essentially the same result as we would get if we just used geometrical optics. So for delta u greater than 10, we get, it can be shown, I should say, by the interested student, that for delta u greater than some number like 10, we get essentially the same result as predicted by geometrical optics. Uh, we'll see in a little minute, in a couple minutes, that it's maybe it's close to what you get by geometrical optics, but you still get some fringes in there. And so that's saying that n sub f greater than or equal to 10 squared over 8, which is about 12. For Fresnel numbers greater than some number like 12, you're getting close to what you would get from geometrical optics. Okay. So are you now a semi-expert on the diffraction of uh, rectangular apertures? Well, I, last class, I brought in this handout that I will refer to now. And I just, all I, I had gone through some calculations using uh, Mathematica here. And I'll just show you what's in the handout. And so here, I mean, it's the same thing we had before. I, I was slit. I just looked in one dimension here to make life a little simpler for me. Source, Z1 away is the aperture. Z2 away is observation plane. And we first just go through here and define the uh, the u just like we had done in a few minutes ago. And so often, you know, you see that the source is at infinity. So I just put in u, z is equal to infinity and what u is equal to. And then wrote down the Fresnel um, integrals here, cosine one first, and then the sine one's coming up. And the nice thing in Mathematica, and a lot of different packages that do these calculations, but um, for Mathematica, the thing called Fresnel, capital C of U, is this integral right here. And um, the sine Fresnel integral is just Fresnel S U. And just put in here the conversion from the um, yeah, this plane to this plane. Same thing we've covered in class. And um, then defined the amplitude here is just 1 over the square root of 2 for now here and I for now there. And um, uh, intensity, we just square that out. And we did it in one dimension, it's not two here. And then I went through some calculations, and that's really what I want to show you, some results here. So put in widths of um, uh, apertures of different widths, or calculating here, 
this parameter that for these notes I call 2t, which is this w times this factor right here, um, the 2 z1 plus z2 over um, lambda z1 z2. And so what we had just gone through in class I called wb and 2t was what we called delta u. I made some plots here. So first off, we're t. Now this is 2t. Well, I'll say we're 2t then is 0.6. And this is the, the um, geometrical image. And this is the diffraction image we get. So if with a narrow slit, things are spread out a lot. Then this is it's close to what we're later going to call Fraunhofer diffraction for, for 2t equal to 0.6. Now we're going to increase the size of the aperture here. Now we're going to make 2t 1 and a half. And the dashed line here would be the geometrical image. And the red line is the Bell uh, diffraction pattern. Anyway, just go through and look at a couple of these. And this is for 2t equal 2.4. 2t equal to um, what 3.7. Certainly it's changing. Keep going here a couple more, or four more. 2t is 4.7, five and a half, 6.2. And then we we'll go to the one where um, we should be close to geometrical optics. And this is what the books say are close to geometrical optics, I guess. So this was 2t is equal to 10.1. And we just said that when it was you know, 10 or greater, we get close to geometrical optics. So this is what's predicted by geometrical optics. And this is our diffraction pattern. So it follows it, you know, reasonably closely, but you do have what I'll call interference fringes in here. It's not, it's uniform, it's what you'd have for, um, for uh, a geometrical image. But it's, it's closer than, say, what we got. I'll go to the other extreme here. Certainly is a lot closer than what we what we had in this example here. So anyway, that's just running through some some calculations, looking at the different diffraction patterns that you get for different values of uh, 2t, as I called it here, or wu, as we call it in the in the notes here. So that's results then for rectangular apertures. Any questions? I think maybe you'll have a little opportunity to uh, do a homework problem based on some of this stuff. Shall we go on? OK, so this, I mean, it worked out fairly well. It was a little messy getting to the result, but the end result wasn't bad, where we said that um, you know, we just put an aperture in here. And uh, instead of looking here to find a diffraction pattern, we kept our point fixed, and we just moved the aperture around swept the diffraction pattern across this point and uh, did our Fresnel integrals as we moved this around. Now I want to look at another situation. And this is going to be a situation where we have either a long slit, or the real case I'm going to look at is where we have a, a knife edge, a straight edge. So let's see how we might go through that calculation here. So this is section 13.5. So this is called large aperture. And so this is a long slit or a straight edge. Well, this almost makes me a little nervous when I think about doing this. Because now what we're going to have is that these A's and these B's become very large. Um, and the thing is that if A and B become large, the approximations that we've made um, concerning, well, we 
made them concerning the um, cosine factor, obliquity factor. We made them concerning uh, 1 over r1, 1 over r2. We made um, approximations calculating e to the i k r1 plus r2. Anyway, if a and b become large, all these approximations break down. And so you kind of worry about the answer we're going to get. And, uh, but the real problem is if we try to work it out without making these approximations, it uh, becomes a very difficult problem. So let's just for a second, let's not worry about these approximations and just see what happens here. Uh, we will ignore problems. Now you never, I'm sure no one here ever does that, right? In any case, we'll just ignore these problems. Now let's think for a second here. Oh, well. um, we're calculating, you know, an e to the i uh, psi, which was um, going back. I mean, that was a, the cosine Brunel transform. If a and b become large, I mean, this is going to be at infinity minus c of minus infinity, and the sine one would be of infinity minus s of minus infinity. So just on these integrals, we're going to put in plus or minus infinities. And if you go through this and calculate the integrals, what you end up with is a, a 1 plus i, it turns out. Leave that to the interested student. Or we could rewrite that as a square root of 2 times e to the i pi over 4. So just forgetting about the problems, we just blindly calculate through, we would get square root of 2 e to the i pi over 4. And likewise, if we did it in the other direction, um, b e to the i chi would also be square root of 2 e to the i pi over 4 if we put in plus or minus infinities. Well, if we just keep calculating along here, Forgetting that we may have problems, u of p is u double zero of p over 2i a e to the i um, psi, I guess I have, b e to the i chi. And if we just plug in here, square root of 2 e to the i pi over 4, square root of 2 e to the i pi over 4, we get the result that u is equal to u double zero of p. And that i of p is i double zero of p. Correct result. So we just go through here and we don't worry that we're violating all these approximations we made. We actually get the, the correct result when we let the size of the aperture becomes uh, infinite. And, um, you know, maybe that's a little surprising, but I guess if we go back and we really look at the fundamental restriction on the um, Kirchhoff theory, I'll say not, you know, it's kind of surprising, but we say not uh, extremely surprising. Uh, since the fundamental restriction on the Kirchhoff theory was that Z1 and Z2 of many wavelengths. And so it actually works out. You, you might think that it would not work out, but it, it actually does work out. We can, we can go through here and put in long slits or knife edge, which is what we're going to look at next, and calculate the diffraction pattern here and actually get results that uh, agree very closely to experiments. Okay. 
So let's do that. Let's see what we get here. So let's put in a knife edge. And um, so what we have, source here, observation plane here. And I'm going to put in a knife edge here. Okay. So again, Z1 and Z2. And we're going to look here at the diffraction pattern we get. And again, our approach for doing this will be to keep this point fixed. And we're going to take this and move it around. So this is a knife edge. So in one direction, you know, out of the paper, it goes from infinity, plus infinity to minus infinity. Here, the aperture goes from wherever that knife edge is to infinity. Or I guess uh, following my notes, I'll say minus infinity here. And so the limits on this integral, so we're going to go back calculate, and maybe I've lost it now in this pile up here. No. We're going to go back, and we're going to calculate this right here, where three of these limits are going to be either plus or minus infinity, and the other one is going to be related to wherever that knife edge is. And so squiggle two is minus infinity. Um, eta 1 is equal to infinity, eta 2 is minus infinity, and um, what we end up with then is the one of interest, AE to the I psi here will be C of squiggle, uh, I guess I call it squiggle 1, which will be the squiggle related to wherever this is located. When it's right on the axis, it would be 0. And as we move it back and forth here, it's going to change by our equations. Minus C of minus infinity plus I times S of squiggle 1 minus S of minus infinity. And if squiggle 1 is equal to 0, uh, P, observation point P, is at edge of geometrical shadow. So we're just going to go to these Fresnel integrals and plug in the limits of squiggle 1 and minus infinity. And for the other direction, it will be um, minus infinity and plus infinity. And calculate through. And um, so I just happen to bring an output here. So if we could zoom in. So I'll just I put in a limit here of you know, some number x and then minus infinity. And um, we calculate then for the diffraction pattern. goes like so. And for x equal to 0 would correspond to being right at the edge of the geometrical shadow. And that turns out to be 0.5. So right at the edge of the shadow, the amplitude is 0.5. Um, 1 would be if we took the knife away. As I move into the shadow, this drops off here. As I move out of the shadow, we get some ringing here, interference fringes. And it oscillates about 1, which is what you would have if you took the oh. nose edge away. So it's 0.5 at the boundary. 
and then you get this oscillation up here. And this is going into the shadow. So this here would be, you know, looking back in this direction, and then this ringing here is looking out in this direction. And we could square that to get the intensity. And that's what we have down here. And so now the amplitude was a half at the edge of the shadow. So this had better be a quarter. And then we go up here and it oscillates about one, which is what we'd have if we took the knife edge away. And we get this pattern like so. So this is the Fresnel diffraction pattern due to a knife edge. Okay. Any questions? Have any of you done this in the lab? Well, I'm sure you have, but you didn't know it, maybe. That whenever you, um, you know, easy to see it with a laser beam, you illuminate something with a sharp edge, you'll see a, you know, maybe the details would be too small for you to observe, but you'll see this ringing here, and then the edge is not real sharp. You know, geometrically, maybe I should have, I should have shown, should have drawn the geometrical curve for this, which would just be zero up here to one and back. Okay. I think I'll do that. So that's the geometrical image. Okay. Now it's kind of interesting that we have this little ringing out here. And what could be causing that? And of course, what do you see when you look at this? What does that remind you of? Serious test question here. Fringes. Okay. Everything you see has to be fringes, so that's fringes. So to get fringes we have to have two beams interfering. Where do we get two beams here? Well, out in this region, we get the beam that goes straight through and you get light coming from this edge right here. In fact, if you put your eye back here and look back at this knife edge, that edge is going to be very, very bright. And so what we have out here are the interference fringes coming from the beam going straight through and the beam coming right from that edge. And so as we move out here, the angles between the two beams is getting larger and the fringes should get closer together as we move out here. And they do. In fact, if you just go through a little calculation, try to calculate the spacing of these fringes just based on the fact that you have a beam going straight through here and a beam coming from this edge, you'll find out you get spacing just like this. Question? Beam coming from the edge. I mean, there's no source there or anything. Like no, but if you look back here, it will, it will look very bright. It's going to... Um, just do a diffraction, there's a nice little cylinder wave coming off of this edge. Effective diffraction here. I mean, even if it's, um, I mean, a problem if you try to use a piece of paper or something for this edge, it's kind of rough and it lights up because it's scattering light. But if you put something here that's real sharp and, and not causing scattering, just do the diffraction, you'll get a, a cylinder, cylinder wave coming from this edge. And that interferes or straight through to give you fringes here. And that's how light gets back here. The light going straight through, I mean, it doesn't get back into the shadow. But the light coming from here, that little cylinder wave coming from there, will get back into the shadow region. And that's why you have light here. But you don't have a straight through beam, so you don't get fringes here. You just get the light coming from the edge of that knife. Okay. Any questions? Well, this knife edge, it's kind of neat the way it works. Well, let me ask you a question. You don't have a question for me. I'm going to make a new knife edge. And my knife edge, you know, instead of using a razor blade, which is what I might normally use here, I'm going to go to Thin Films people. 
And I'm going to have them make me a knife edge that is 100% transmitting. But I have a 180 degree phase change between here and here. So it's a phase knife edge. 180 degree phase for light transmitted through here, nothing down here. Everything transmits. You either tell me what the pattern is going to look like or tell me how to calculate the pattern. What would you do? Whose principle might you use or something here? Babinet's. Ah! <laughs> Babinet's. How did you ever guess? So what we could calculate here, you know, I can break this phase knife edge into two knife edges. One normal one like this. And then the other normal one is where the knife edge comes from the bottom, but then I have a 180 degree phase change up here. And so from one knife edge, I would get a pattern like this. I don't know how well we're going to be able to see through the paper, but one pattern would look like this, and the other one looked the same. Eh, you can see it, except it's flipped over. And there's one other difference between this and this. Phase knife edge of 180 degree phase change. So these two patterns, you know, one like this, one like this, but they differ in phase by 180 degrees. Right at this point, right here, so this thing is flipped over, they both have the same amplitude, right at the edge of the geometrical shadow. But they're out of phase by 180 degrees. So you're going to get a pattern that goes like this, and then it's going to dip down to zero, come back, and like this again. And you have a nice zero right at the center of the pattern. OK, any questions on um, Fresnel diffraction of a knife edge? You're all experts on this. OK. Well, let me ask you another question then here. We saw how to calculate the following situation. We said if we put an aperture in here, we now know how to calculate using these Fresnel integrals. We now know how to calculate the irradiance distribution here, amplitude and irradiance distribution. But let me give you a different problem. Now what I have is an obstacle here. How would I calculate the diffraction pattern here now? Again, whose principle do you use? <laughs> OK, so we'll go back. We're going to use Babinet's principle. And let u naught of p be the amplitude for the slit. u naught prime of p. So that's the for the slit. And this will be the amplitude of the obstacle. I'll just call it that. And so we know that u naught of p, u naught prime of p, is u double zero of p minus u naught of p. So it's whatever we would have clear aperture minus what we get for the rectangular aperture is what we'll get for the slit. Um, excuse me, what we'll get for the obstacle. And this, remember, if we have a completely open aperture, so now the integral goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Remember we said that was uh, square root of, in one dimension, square root of 2 e to the i pi over 4. Or 
1 plus i over square root of 2. So you can calculate for slits or you can calculate for obstacles. Okay. Any questions? Okay, well, the next section is a section I've not had in previous years, but I thought I would put it in this year. And it's section 13.6, and it's called Talbert Images. And if you go to Goodman, section 4.5.2. He has a, a section on Talbot images. That's in a new edition. The older edition doesn't have it. And he goes through here and he calculates these images um, using a transfer function approach. And I think everyone should read Goodman's book. Uh, well, should read the whole book, but particular section 4.5.2. But I'm going to take a little different approach to what good look. I'm going to get the same result, but I'm going to I'm going to instead of using transfer functions like he uses, I'm going to try to give it a more physical description than what uh, what Goodman does and see if we can calculate this. And so what what we're going to start out with is uh, we're going to put a diffraction grating over here. So this is squiggle eta. And so I'll just draw the grating lines here. This is a diffraction grating. And we haven't really talked about gratings, but um, we can just say that this is something that has an amplitude transmission it's a function of position here that goes as 1 half times 1 plus m, where m is going to be less than or equal to 1, cosine 2 pi squiggle over L. So the period of this grading, distance from one line to the next line is L. Okay. And we're going to say that z is the distance between the grating and the observation plane. And uh, 2 pi squiggle, which is just our variable here, divided by L, the period. So this will go through 2 pi uh, as we move a distance L. So it's, it has a period of L. We're going to illuminate the grating with a plane wave. And so we can say that the field just to the right of the grating is going to be equal to the trans amplitude transmittance written here. So the field after the grating, so if we illuminate this with a unit plane wave, the field after the grating is equal to the amplitude transmittance of the grating. Okay. So let me just rewrite this, the field then, u of squiggle and eta is 1 half, 1 plus m. I'm just going to expand the cosine here as um, e to the i 2 pi squiggle over l plus e to the minus i 2 pi squiggle over l. And I guess I need another bracket. 
Okay, so I just wrote the cosine here. It's expanded as e to the i plus e to the minus i. And if I look at this, I say, well, now we're, we're going to go away from what Goodman did. I look at this and I say, well, that's a plane wave. And this is another plane wave here. And I could write this plane wave as e to the i, 2 pi over lambda. We saw this before in the course. Times uh, squiggle sine theta. So this is a plane wave that's going off at some angle theta relative to my z-axis. You're right. One half there. OK. Thank you. Just checking to see if you're awake. <laughs> OK. OK, so and this is now just a plane wave going along e to the i, 2 pi over lambda, squiggle sine theta. And if theta is small, we're going to look um, at small angles here. It's convenient to write this as e to the i, 2 pi over lambda, squiggle theta. OK. And so I can set this, oops, this equal to this. And we have a 2 pi over lambda. Squiggle theta is 2 pi squiggle over L. OK? This equal that. OK? And so that's saying theta is lambda over L. So what we have, we have the grading plane here. And we have this here. And we have this first term, this light going right along here. And these two terms here, this and this, will be plane waves going up here at theta. And the other one is going down here at theta. OK. Now, in going from here to here, we, we experience some phase. The guy going right down the center here will experience a, a phase as 2 pi over lambda times z. The one going off at an angle here, if we measure the phase of this guy relative to this guy here, we'll get an interesting result here. So if we, if we propagate a distance z, we get a phase change that goes as, well, let's see. I'm trying to remember. There was one equation for this course. I said you had to remember. Does anyone remember what that equation was? You would think it has nothing to do with what we're talking about here, maybe. But something about 2nd cosine theta is m lambda. Right. So we went through here and calculated how the phase changed as a function of angle here. We would get a phase here as a function of angle that goes as 2 pi over lambda. And when we go once, so we don't have a 2 in there, in the 2 nd, n is 1, so we don't have the n, but we d cosine theta. So it's 2 pi over lambda 
times z cosine of theta. Now, you may think it's divided by cosine theta or something, but you should go back and go through that derivation. It's not. It's actually times cosine theta. So if we measure, you know, we have waves propagating like this, we have waves propagating like this and like this, that the phase difference as a function of theta is going to go as 2 pi rho lambda times z cosine theta. And so that is approximately equal to, and I have a race against the clock here, of 2 pi over lambda z cosine theta is about equal for small theta is 1 minus theta squared over 2. And so that's 2 pi over lambda times z minus 2 pi over lambda here, theta squared over 2, um, theta was lambda over L, um, and so this will be 2 pi over lambda z times lambda squared over 2 L squared. And so I could rewrite this, and I guess this is, will be the point where maybe I'll have to stop here. But this is equal to 2 pi over lambda z minus pi z over L squared, excuse me, minus pi, minus pi lambda over L squared times z. Okay. So now what I will do in, oh, it's a long time before we come back, or a couple of weeks before we come back. But what we will do next time then is that we have these different plane waves propagating along. And we said that in the plane of the grating, this was the amplitude. Now we're going to come over here at distance z, and we're going to put in these different phase factors for the different plane waves and find what the phase distribution is. And then we're going to look at that a little bit, and we're going to find some very interesting things that happen as this beam propagates along. We're going to find out that even without any lenses, lenses present, there will be planes when this distribution replicates itself. And then there will be planes in between that where the pattern will be the same but shifted by half a period. And there will other, be other planes where we'll have something of twice the frequency of this. So it's kind of neat what's going to happen. I'm, I'm sorry we have to wait two weeks to do it. But uh, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. And those of you who came to class today, I thank you very much for coming here on your vacation. Of course, I guess that means next week when everyone else is working, you can be on vacation. So I'll see you in a couple of weeks. And thanks a lot.